How's it going, YouTube? Please like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We're recapping all of Monday's action up next. Welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on Tuesday, May 10th. Frank Stanfield joined by Scott White today on the show. Nasty Nestor Cortez. We'll talk about him. What's wrong with Brandon Woodruff? How has offense been overall in the month of May thus far? Team name Tuesday should be a lot of fun and much more. But first, take it away, Susan. Oh, my good goodness gracious. We almost got ourselves an oh, my goodness gracious, legitimate moment from our girl Susan on Monday, Scott. So I will let you start. Ah, right now. Was Roger Clemens in the owner's box? <laughs> I wish. Honestly, I wish that happened. <laughs> I don't know what he'd be doing there. But I mean, anyway. Uh, yeah, Nestor Cortez is my, oh my goodness gracious player of the day because he had to be somebody's, right? One hit the Rangers over seven innings, took a no-hitter very deep into the game. Pitch count was getting kind of high, so, you know, he did have four walks. I'm, I'm not sure he would have been able to complete the no-hitter even if he had avoided giving up that hit. But the point is he pitched really well, and it may be the most impressive stat of all. 11 strikeouts against those Rangers, 17 swinging strikes on 103 pitches. 12 of those swinging strikes came on the cutter, which he threw a ton. It was a, it was really working for him in this start. He threw it 50% of the time. Usually it's under 40. How often he throws that cutter, a more even split between the cutter and the fastball. Uh, so it was, it was a truly dominant start from a pitcher who... Pitches well, but in a way that's pretty unconventional. I would say, like, you know, for as well as Nestor Cortez has pitched this year, it's kind of like last year where you look under the hood and, and, and nothing looks that impressive. Like the swinging strike rate entering this game, which is a good swinging strike rate. Just, you know, we, we, we don't often put it into context, but it's about, what, 12% is a good swinging strike rate? That sounds about right. Yeah. And his was under 10 prior to this start where he got a ton of swing strikes. So it's going to go up some, but it was only, it was like right around 10 last year too, for as well as he pitched then. So I, I don't even know. I don't even know what you do with this information because like Nestor Cortez doesn't need to be this overpowering to be good. And it's not like, you know, nobody was looking to do anything with him. He'd been pitching so well already, but I, I guess it's, it's if you if you were starting to lose confidence in him after a couple of you know his last couple outings were as dominant as the first few uh obviously this this uh should renew your confidence in the very unorthodox left-hander with the mustache <laughs> it's a great mustache by the way him Dylan C, Spencer Strider. Those are the three in terms of like mustache rankings right now. I think those are the ones that are up there for me. C, Strider, Nestor Cortez with the mustache. Yep. Yeah, but, no, that's the, uh, we need one more to, to form a Mount Rushmore of pitcher mustaches in yeah. the year of our Lord 2022. I mean, I'm sure there's another one out there. I'll have to think about it. Someone get on that, but let me know about the mustaches. Scott, I think our natural inclination will be to sell high on Nestor Cortez after a start like this, just for the reasons you mentioned, it, it doesn't really add up. He's just kind of a unique pitcher. Swinging strike rate doesn't really back up all the strikeouts that he gets. I saw this tweet from Andrew McCutcheon, though, and I think it kind of puts it in perspective, from a hitter's perspective, rather. Nestor Cortez fastball plays up, meaning his 91 to 94 actually feels like 97. Mix that with him messing up, uh, messing with a hitter's timing, throwing from different arm angles, and locating well, and he can be very difficult to hit. He showed that today. So mm -hmm. it just kind of puts that in perspective from, yeah. you know, a hitter no, that's been around. I think he's good. I mean, like, yeah. I thought he was good coming into the year. I wish I had hyped him harder. I, you know, basically nobody was drafting him, so I kept taking him late in a bunch of leagues. And uh, I, I don't know. It was It was kind of just giving the benefit of the doubt when no one else was, you know. If nobody else is going to believe in this guy who pitched well last year, I will. And you know, obviously it's paid off so far. I, I'm not moving him into the top 50 in my starting pitcher rankings yet. So, you know, if you could use him to get an underachieving 
Logan Webb or somebody like that, I'd, I'd still obviously do it. But I, I don't, it, it's hard for me to relate to that scenario because I just know it's implausible in any of the leagues I play in with people who analyze baseball for a living. Yeah, no, that's true. I I mean, I'm sure you see your fair share of trade offers, Scott, on Twitter and emails and all this stuff. There's some pretty wacky trades. Go- no, I, I get it. I get yeah. it. I see him. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, so it's, it's, obviously, if you could turn Nestor Cortez into, let's just say, a, a top 50 hitter coming into the season, that's obviously off to a slow start. I still think that's the route that you should go down. We're going to talk about offense from like a macro level view a little bit later on. So we'll talk more about this. But I think oh. that is the way to go about it. We're getting some suggestions for the fourth pitcher on the Mount Rushmore of pitcher mustaches. I think it's a good oh. one. You ready? Uh, I see it. This is a good one. Miles Michaelis. Yes. The Lizard King. It's a great, uh, it's a great mustache. Did you ever hear the story, Scott, about the lizard? No. I believe Miles Michaelis, he ate a live lizard. And so he developed the nickname Lizard King. There might be more to that story, but I think that's the <laughs> gist of the story. <laughs> I would not advise that. That's usually something I'm trying to prevent my kids from doing, you know? like Yeah, don't do not do that for anyone listening at home. We do not condone eating of the live lizard. All right, Nestor Cortez, he was amazing. I'm going to bump him up the rankings a little bit more. Uh, but obviously, if you can, sell high. Don't just sell for the sake of it, like we always say. Josh Naylor, let's talk about him. Oh, my goodness gracious for me. Fiery dude, and he was fiery once again on Monday night. Three for five with a double dong. Two of the more clutch home runs that you will ever see in a regular season game, I guess a game time grand slam off of Liam Hendricks in the eighth inning. And then a go ahead three run Homer in the 11th inning for Josh Naylor in this game. He finished three for five, two homers, eight RBI total in this game. He's 31% rostered Scott. And we've heard the name Josh Naylor for a while. He used to have some prospect pedigree, obviously makes a lot of contact. It's a lot of line drives, but hasn't really been able to put it into I guess, fantasy value or, you know, hit for much power or it just really hasn't been that enticing. Are you buying what we've seen from Josh Naylor to this point? Well, he's only 24. So let's wow. start. Let's that's start pretty, with that. Yeah. That's a lot younger than I thought. Wow. Yeah, me too. <laughs> he's only 24. He got called up pretty young because the numbers in the minors were great uh, when he was still with the Padres. I, first off, I want to point out, you know, we're talking about throwback looks with all the pitcher mustaches, like the, <laughs> The look Josh Naylor has going on with no batting gloves, the high socks, the baggy pants. He's got kind of a stocky build himself, you know, it, like that's a throwback look to him, him hitting that home run and then tossing the bat aside. Like that's like, that should be a highlight that's in black and white. Cause it just, it's just so out of its time. But beyond that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think anytime a player this young who has a strong minor league track record starts making some noise. It's it's worth paying attention to. He hasn't been playing all that consistently. He's a left-handed batter. So, you know, Cleveland's been sitting him against left-handers, but beyond that, they they've been sitting him against some right-handers too. And maybe that changes with this performance, but they're, they're kind of in a bind at like, they have they have so many hitters who are I it's it's weird to say for for Cleveland Guardians, but they have so many hitters who are 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 actually hitting well that they're having trouble fitting them all in the lineup. They're having to move Owen Miller all around. They're having to move Andres Jimenez around. Mm. You, you know, Stephen Kwan obviously has has kind of made himself into a a, a fixture at the top of the lineup, a table setter for them. And uh, like Framel Reyes is playing time has suffered because of them trying to find a bats for all these players. So I'm not saying you can't pick up Naylor, but I don't, I don't think we're at a place yet until we see him playing more consistently and until they prove that they're willing to find regular bats for him. I don't know that we're at a place where you can get him in your lineup yet, at least not in a standard size league. Okay. So we're not in any type of must add territory here, Scott, but five outfielder leagues probably should get him on your team. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd willing, he's showing upside and, and yeah, there's, 
there's a chance he starts playing more based on that. I mean, the strikeout rate is down to nothing else. I don't know if you mentioned that, but he's 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 been making a lot of contact early on, which is a good, always a good sign. And stop me if you've heard this before about a hitter performing well this year, but the pull rate is up for Josh Naylor this year compared to his career mark. So he's pulling the ball more, lots of line drives, and so far that's worked out quite well for him. Scott, if you're looking for an outfielder to add, would you rather have him or Tommy Pham? I think Pham. I think, I think so Pham because he's going to get the playing time and and like the like the data, the stat cast data, the batted ball stuff is is stronger for him than it is for Framil Reyes. Granted, it was the past couple of years in San Diego and it didn't go well for Pham, but he's in Cincinnati now, opposite end of the spectrum in terms of a hitting environment. And plus he steals bases. So yeah, I, I just think there are too many advantages Pham has over Naylor to, to go the other way. Tommy Pham, by the way, two for four with his second steal of the season on Monday night. His last 15 games, he's betting 302 with a 413 on base percentage. I still think Tommy Pham is the most under-rostered hitter right now. He's 46% rostered. There's really just not a lot of outfielders performing. Uh, I would have to imagine someone in your league can use Tommy Pham. So go out there and add him if he is available. As always, Scott, I'm going to bring up a few names that I still think are rostered too, in too many leagues. If you say El Garcia, 60% rostered, would you be okay dropping him for both of these guys? Yep. How about Jorge Soler? I still have... Like, I think Jorge Soler is one of those players who deserves a ton of patience because, I mean, he was he was a monster from late July on last year. And, and if you dropped him before that, obviously you regretted it. How about Jared Kelnick? I think you can drop Kelnick for fam, at least. I might hesitate to do it for Naylor, but there's a chance... Kelnick gets sent down soon. Yeah, Kyle Lewis, we'll talk about him in a little bit. He's been performing quite well through his first four minor league rehab games. Uh, last name I'll mention, Scott, Joey Gallo, 82% rostered. He's dealt with, I believe it was a groin injury. He's been in and out of the lineup a little bit and obviously just hasn't been great. He's still 82% rostered. What do you do there? Yeah, I think I think like Solaire, if you if you dump him, you're, you're giving 40 home runs to somebody else. Oh gosh, he's just, he is so painful, man. He is such a painful, yeah, is painful. I get it. Like there could be a month where he just, you know, he hits like double digit home runs. It, it can happen and it's going to happen right after you drop him. but it's, oh God. You know, oh, and I'll make the distinction for both Soler and, and Gallo. If you're talking a three outfielder points league in particular, then whatever, like that's fine. I, I think even in a, in, in a, in a categories league, like any kind of head to head league, uh, you know, that streakiness you're because, because it's a, a game that happens a week at a time, as opposed to a full season accumulation of Roto, you can't put up with the streakiness as much. And certainly when it's three outfielders, obviously the standard is for an outfielder to meet is higher. So I think it's okay to move on from Soler. And I'd say even Gallo in those formats, especially in points, Maybe even in categories, if you're, you know, if you can honestly find something that you're confident is better. But there will come a time in the season when you regret it, even in those formats, because they're tearing it up. For sure. Some other fun hitter standouts from Monday. Julio Rodriguez, three more hits and over his last 17 games, he's batting 344 with a 22% strikeout rate. So that strikeout rate is down tremendously from where it was at early on. He leads baseball with 10 steals. He's the first to double digit stolen bases. And this was his second game now batting third in the lineup in a row. So Julio Rodriguez has earned that promotion up the lineup and he's been fantastic. We want to see a little bit more power, obviously, but with the batting average coming around and the steals, obviously we love everything he's doing right now. And then Mike Trout and Shohei Otani, they went back to back in this game on Monday. And then Otani later adds a grand slam. So giving him a double dong and it was his first grand slam ever in MLB or Japan. So Love to see it, mm. both Mike Trout and Shohei Otani. A few other, go ahead, Scott. Surprising, his first Grand Slam ever, including his time in Japan, because he was obviously a great player in Japan. Yeah, yeah, we were talking beforehand. I had the game on. I was like, really, first ever? It's 
doesn't uh, seem so weird. Uh, a few other waiver wire hitters. I already mentioned Tommy Pham and Josh Naylor, of course. The Orioles, I feel like I talk about them every day. Trey Mancini is someone we haven't really mentioned. He's got 11 hits over his last six games. He's hitting the ball hard. Lots of line drives. Actually, the sixth highest line drive rate among qualified hitters for Trey Mancini. He's batting 280. The problem, only one home run. And I think power is going to be hard to come by for these right-handed hitters in Baltimore. He's 49% rostered. Scott, of course, the other two names, Austin Hayes, two more hits, now batting 317. Uh, Jorge Mateo, feels like we mention him quite often, but he stole his ninth base. He's 32% rostered. So I, I think that there's more than 32% of CBS leagues, our category leagues. So he should probably be rostered in all of those leagues. Yeah, probably. I mean, he might. As as we get deeper into the season here, and he looks more and more like a steel specialist uh, who won't really provide anything else, and his you know his OPS is in the mid six hundreds. So I mean, at some point, you have to question the job security too. Whatever else, I don't know what else the Orioles are going to do at shortstop, but I I, I think Jorge Mateo is uh, is not an especially valuable player, but he does contribute a lot of that one thing that everybody could use more of, which is stolen bases. For sure. Uh, another one here, Brandon Drury. I mentioned his name yesterday, Scott, and it seemed like we could just kind of brushed it off. I get it. He's been around for a while, journeyman, whatever, but he's playing every day right now for the Reds. It's a good ballpark, and he went two for five on Monday, hit his sixth home run of the season. This one off of Brandon Woodruff, and now Drury's batting 284. He's got a 930 OPS, barrel rate, hard hit rate, both up this season. Expected numbers look really strong. Brandon Drury, 22% rostered, has triple eligibility, second base, shortstop, outfield. Are you a little more interested one day later after he has his big game? I'll say this, and, and, and I was saying this early last year too. And they're, they're, it's so hard to find, like everybody feels like they're lacking in offense, right? And, and you get a guy who's actually producing. I don't care who it is. You can't, you can't really dismiss it just because you're you're having a hard time getting production anywhere. I'm skeptical. I'm highly skeptical. The barrel rate you mentioned is is high. It's it's very high by his standards. And of course, that's going to lead to good expected stats if your barrel rate is that high. But as I've been saying, like barrel rate being unusually high or low, I feel like especially this early in the season, it's an indicator of of just are you hot or are you cold? Now, I mean, players have improved their barrel rate from one year to the next in in considerable ways, but I'd still bet against it. When, when everything else looks pretty normal for him, except that, and he's producing like he is, you know, I, it's probably going to be short-lived, but you can pick him up as a short-term villain since he's actually producing right now and see where it goes i mean that's that's the thing about a hot hand play is if it turns out they're more than that well you already have them mm -hmm. if nothing else add him for the position eligibility too i mean in any roto leagues where you have a middle a corner you need five outfielders you can plug him into any of those spots so i picked up brandon jury in a 15 team roto league my nfbc main event i, I started him this week just because I, I desperately needed a corner infielder and Obviously, I love what he did on Monday. So uh, we'll, we'll keep following Brandon Drury, see if he can keep it up. Let's talk about the gentleman who he hit the home run off of, Brandon Woodruff. What is wrong with Brandon Woodruff at the Reds on Monday? He allowed six runs over four and a third. Five of those were earned. He still had six strikeouts, uh, 11 swinging strikes in this game on 92 pitches. He gave up nine hard hit balls. The ERA is now up to 5.97. The whip is up to 1.36 for Brandon Woodruff. Scott, what are you seeing right now with him, and are you worried? I'm not worried because I don't see much. Now, the velocity is down a little this year, which I, I'm not sure we've mentioned before for Woodruff. Not like Shane Bieber levels or anything, but it's down a little bit. But the, the whiff rate, the strikeout rate, the expected stats – whether you're talking about like XBA, X slug, or XERA, like they're all the same for Woodruff. Like he's missing bats at his usual rate, and StatCast 
thinks he deserves the same results uh, that he got last year. So I think it's just, I, I just think it, you know, it, it feels a lot worse that he's having starts like this at a time when so many even bad pitchers are putting up good numbers. Like it, it really accentuates the struggles, but I think in most years, if he had a, a stretch of a couple starts, like his last two or three, you know, it, it, it'd be easier to dismiss. And, and I'll mention that in his last start, he had 12 strikeouts. So yeah, I, I don't see much reason to worry about Woodruff. I get that it's frustrating, but I don't really see anything that's wrong. Yeah, there's just a few things that are off with him right now and things that would lead to bad results. The walks, BABIP, home run rate, average exit velocity, hard hit rate. Those are all up a little bit this season. His fly ball rate is up quite a bit. I mean, that, that was kind of an issue for Aaron Nola last year too. And it was really random because like Aaron Nola, Brandon Woodruff usually does a decent job of getting ground balls. But yeah, this year it's 46% fly ball rate for his career. It's 33%. And then the strand rate has been unlucky too. It's 59% this season, 76% for Woodruff's career, but swinging strike rate, first pitch strikes, chase rate, all of those look fine, Scott. He's got a 5.97 ERA. Woodruff has a 3.26 XFIP, and, and that's including this start. So mm -hmm. I know we say this a lot about struggling pitchers, but we can really only tell you what the underlying numbers say. And right now they say to buy. Yep. All right. It's as easy as that. <laughs> uh, so if you have Brandon Woodruff, better days should be coming for him. Let's talk about offense overall, a macro level look. Obviously, April was terrible for offense. How has May been thus far? Not good. So if we're just comparing May to April, uh, batting average is up three points to 234. BABIP is actually down one point. So if you're wondering how, why batting average is actually up a little bit, uh, it's because strikeout rate is actually down a little bit in the month of May. Home run to fly ball ratio, 10.3% in May. 10% flat in April. So that really has not budged at all. Uh, home runs per game up by a, a fraction of a point. Not much going on there. Steals are actually down a little bit in the month of May. So overall, it's kind of just been static. I know it's still been cold in most places around the country, the Northeast. Yeah. Just saw a bunch of games canceled over the weekend, rain, cold weather. So yeah. it, it really hasn't heated up much. And I looked at the first eight days of May from last year. Obviously, I don't remember what the weather was last year, but it's completely different. Like the batting average was a little bit higher. The home run to fly ball ratio was up four percentage points, 14.6% uh, in the first eight days of May last season. So mm -hmm. overall, the, 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 the first week, Scott, has been less than encouraging, but yeah, we haven't had great weather either. So. I'd give it the remaining 22 days of May because... I like, you know, it's it's obviously not a magical thing that happens because the calendar happens to change. It's because May has different environmental conditions than April. And we haven't seen that change as much. Like it would be it would be completely ahistoric for offense not to improve in May. Like that always, always happens. I, I'm not saying it's gonna undo everything that was down in, in April. I have wondered if the impact of the humidor, whatever way it was suppressing offense in April, if it could make for an even more dramatic shift as it gets more humid. Uh, because, you know, when you're, when you're drying out balls in more humid environments, the ball's going to carry better. So I, I've wondered if the improvement in offense would be more dramatic than in years past. But I just, I don't think the, the weather has changed enough for us to say. And, and I, I'd really want to reassess in May, but yeah, it's, it does, it, it, it doesn't make sense at all. Unless, unless they go to an even better ball in May, that offense would not improve to some degree in May. Now the biggest improvement will be in batting average more than, in, than in home runs. I, I, I think, I think it's, I think we're definitely in a worse home run league now. Yep. Uh, because that, that doesn't change the home run to fly ball rate. It does improve in the summer months, but not as drastically as you see the BABIP improve or even the strikeout rate for hitters on the hitter side improve uh, as we go deeper into the season. So I, I think that, that the bigger impact will be in batting average than in home run production. 
but there will be some improvement. And I think we need to wait until the end of May to get a better sense of how it's going. I want to mention this too, since we're talking about league wide offensive trends, because I haven't seen anyone else bring this up. So everybody is, you know, most analysts are reliant on StatCast data because it's very good. But StatCast data only goes back to 2015. It's it's not a very complete picture picture of widespread changes in 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 the league. Those kinds of you know those those paradigm shifts where the the league environment changes in whatever way. So it only goes back to 2015. But we have home run to fly ball rates dating all the way back to 2002. And if you look at those home run to fly ball rates, leaving StatCast data out of it, what you see is that 2002 through 2000 for, through 2014. So the majority of that time that we have that home run to fly ball data looks very much like this year. It's, a, it's right around 10% every year. Some years it's a little higher, around 11%. Some years it's a little lower. It's, it's below 10%. Uh, but the the stretch that stands out as being the exception to the rule is 2015 and especially 2016 through 2021. So th this year is less the outlier than the past six, seven years have been. It's six and seven years is a long time. So, so, you know, people need to kind of recalibrate their thinking and I'm sure hitters and, and pitchers for that matter are going to have to recalibrate their approaches because a fly ball isn't going to be as rewarding as it's been for the past six, seven years. But ultimately it's, re it, it appears to be returning baseball to a standard that was in place prior to, prior to the stat cast era. Yeah, I think something I was looking into as well is that I've noticed, and I saw you tweeting about this too, that a strikeout rate is down, you know, yep. across baseball this That's, year as yep. well. And I, I think, I think pitchers are purposely pitching to contact. It's partially that and the fact that, you know, sticky substances are yeah. gone this year or so. I, we I think it's, I think, I think it's mostly the sticky substances, but you're right. It, pitchers may already be less fearful of contact. And I, I think part part of the reason why they're doing that is, is just the shifts right now. I mean, defensive positioning is, is just so stellar. I heard this on a broadcast recently, and they said it, it feels like every time a ball is hit hard, you look up and, and there's just a defender there, like on, all over the field. So as a result, that's going to lead to lower BABIP and lower batting yeah. average overall. Uh, basically, Scott, we have to figure out what does this mean overall, though, for fantasy. Like, it's... yeah. I think it's good to talk about and, and, you know, let everyone know what's going on in the game, but what does it mean? And I think for me, uh, I think we try and cash in on some of those pitchers who pitch to contact. I don't think that they're going to be able to maintain it, maintain this for the entirety of the season. The problem is a lot of these guys are, are, are lower end pitchers. So I don't really know what you're going to get for them anyway, but the ones that stood out most to me, who have the biggest differential between their ERA and their current FIP, according to Fangraphs, Brad Keller, Chad cool, Again, not sure how much you're going to get for that. Miles Michaelis, he has a little bit of a track record. Merrill Kelly, someone we spoke about yesterday. And even though his ERA is 1.22, his FIP is still 2.05. So he just in general has been really, really good. Yeah. Noah Syndergaard is another really interesting one to talk about. He had a, another pretty good start on Monday. He's got a 2.45 ERA. His, his uh, ex-FIP is 3.89. And then I think some of the injury-prone pitchers, Scott, like Clayton Kershaw and Pablo Lopez and, and Carlos Carrasco, if you have an abundance of pitching, I think these are the names that I'm looking to try and flip for offense, the ones that pitch to contact and maybe some of these injury-prone pitchers as well. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think in general people are going to want to trade pitching for hitting more than the other way around. I, I also like I, I've also noticed I was, I was writing like a dynasty stock watch piece earlier uh, where, you know, obviously the standard for a player's value and changing in dynasty is higher than it is in, in a redraft league. Like you, you want to be really sure about changes in, in expected output before you change your assessment of a player in dynasty. 
And I have a really hard time sizing up any hitter at this point because the landscape's changed so much and we're coming off a, a month where, you know, we were, it, it was, it served to suppress offense further and we were faked out by a lot of hitters last April and it improved as the season went on. And so I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure which hitters to trade for so much. I mean, hitting the ball harder is probably more important than ever now. So that would be a good place to start. Um, but more than anything, I'm, 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 I'm still mostly relying on track record. You know, with maybe average exit velocity being a secondary matter. So yeah, it's 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 tough to play in this environment. I, I think it'll be easier again, as, as I said at the end of May, to to size up everybody. But I th I think just as a general rule, yeah, like excess pitching. If you can trade it for hitting, that's probably a smart idea. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> there's so few hitters that are performing. It's just, I, I think I would, uh, you, you just need more offense to compete. Uh, so, right. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's my, like, that's the takeaway. Like we're, we're obviously we're trying to figure out like just having an overall takeaway for all this conversation. And, and I think that's it for me. So I do want to say getting away from the fantasy angle that between the sticky substance ban serving to reduce strikeouts for the first time in decades and return with the deadened ball returning home run fly to fly ball rates more to historic norms and the banning of the shift next year. I mean, I, I think this is all going to play out in a positive way for the aesthetic of the game. It's going to become less of a three true outcomes game, which is, which is what most baseball fans want to see. They want to see the the excitement of players running around the bases and fielders having to make plays as opposed to just seeing strikeouts and home runs all the time. So I think it I think it's all going to work together to restore the aesthetic of the game in, in a way that we're all going to appreciate when when it's said when all's said and done. But we're kind of going through the growing pains right now. And it's it's mostly frustrating, particularly for those of us who play fantasy. Yeah, I think we're going to see a return too for those. You hear them called like professional hitters, ones that could just spray the ball all over, hit the ball where defenses aren't like DJ LeMahieu and Jeff McNeil and guys like that. Like we'll see those batting averages climb over mm -hmm. the next couple of years, I think. And I also think it's going to create more of a separation, Scott, between the elite power hitters like we've seen in the past, like let's say yep. Aaron Judge and Pete Alonzo, there's going to be a much more of a separation between those guys and the middle class where we've seen, you know, middle infielders popping 20 homers or 25 right. homers or like fringe outfielders hitting 20 to 25 homers. Uh, and right. it'll just make those sluggers more valuable in the future as well. So Yeah, well, I mean, anybody who's played fantasy baseball for 10 years or longer remembers how different it used to be. Like there were different like phenotypes of hitter. It wasn't just is this guy going to hit 20 home runs or 30? You know, it was, it was like, okay, this guy's going to provide me some power and some batting average. This guy's going to provide me a ton of power. This guy's going to provide me a no, no power, but you know, he, he does enough other things well that he's still useful. And, and it, it made the game more interesting. It, it made the fantasy game more interesting too, frankly. And in addition to the real life game. So yeah, I think three years from now, it's all going to have been worth it, but right now we're we're kind of we're kind of scratching our heads over it. All right, before we hit the break, if you listen to us on Spotify, please feel free to leave us a five star rating. It's something that they've introduced, you know, the past year or so, where you can now leave ratings on Spotify. So help us out there, five stars. We really do appreciate it. We're gonna take a quick break, and when we return, news and notes here on Fantasy Baseball Today. This season, I've only invited an elite group of competitors. This will be your biggest competition yet. You don't come to a challenge and not be ready to win. This is the most cutthroat game. Gone are the days of men running the game. Only shooting stars break the, the challenge all-stars. 
streaming May 11th exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. All right, the news and notes. Lance Lynn is targeting an early June return. He had knee surgery just before the season. Jack Flaherty will throw his second bullpen session on either Tuesday or Wednesday this week. Blake Snell will make his third rehab start at AAA on Tuesday. Dylan Floro was activated on Monday, 41% rostered. Uh, Scott, are you looking to add Dylan Floro in category leagues right now? It seems like there's an opening for the <laughs> Mariners closer job again. Marlins. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, certainly Anthony Bender hasn't been getting the job done recently. Anybody else they've tried. Is Floro that good? No. So, I mean, I'm not sure he's going to take the job and run with it, but if, if you're in a league where, you know, they're, they're, everybody's always rushing to the next potential save source, then yeah, I think you need to beat the rush to Floro and just see what happens. All righty. Seiya Suzuki was removed from Monday's game with ankle soreness. Manny Margot left with hamstring soreness after stealing two bases. So he was well on his way to another breakout game. And I saw, I think earlier on Monday, he was announced as like the American League hitter of the week. So he's been hot. He's been awesome, but obviously uh, slowed down a little bit by this hamstring injury. Brandon Belt scratched once again with neck stiffness. Akil Badu, I have a feeling that my bold prediction of 30 30 is is not going to come true for no kid, unfortunately no he was option to triple a on monday uh he was batting just 140 with a 438 ops uh his quality of contact is way down this year the infield fly ball rate is up and Derek hill is the one that seems slated for more playing time just a name to watch in deeper leagues he hit 259 with three homers six steals in 49 games last season and he does have some big stolen base seasons in the minors. Again, that is Derek Hill, a name to watch. David Robertson was placed on the IL for undisclosed reasons, which sounds like a COVID situation. Wade Miley will make his Cubs debut on Tuesday against the Padres. Last year, he had a 3.37 ERA, 1.33 whip. Underlying numbers didn't really like Wade Miley as much. He's 17% rostered. Scott, any interest there? Wade Miley. I mean, not with the current state of pitching. I, I'm sure there will be times when I'm recommending him as a streamer, but last year was kind of an outlier for him, and he faded down the stretch even then. Uh, Scott, I actually think the other, I go the other way, because Wade Miley, he's one of these fringe pitchers that pitches to contact, right? That means he's going to do great. He's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's going to be just as good as Miles Michaelis. And all these yeah, other well, I mean, for however long Miles Michaelis stays good. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. The Lizard King. Ray's pitching prospect Shane Boz was slated to throw uh, batting practice on Monday. I haven't seen an update yet on that. I'm sure if anything went wrong, we probably would have heard about it. Uh, he had arthroscopic elbow surgery to remove loose bodies back in March. Uh, Shane Boz is eligible to return June 6th, but we're not quite sure just yet. If that will happen, Taylor Ward did not play on Monday due to a tight hamstring, though he expects to return on Tuesday. Your Moncada made his season debut Monday, and I wrote in here that he went one for three, but I'm pretty sure he had another at bat after that. So let's see what he did. He went one for four with a walk, strikeout, and a run scored. John Gray exited Monday's start early due to left knee soreness. He's already been on the IL once with. Uh, that same MCL injury in his knee. Kyle Lewis is hitting well early on in his rehab. He's six for 17 with two homers in his first four games. He is 48% rostered. Scott, do you think that number should be higher for Kyle Lewis? Yeah, I haven't been, I haven't been the biggest Kyle Lewis guy. In theory, he has power as much as you can predict that for any player these days. But yeah, I just think the contact skills are lacking. Too lacking for him to really make good on it, especially in this offensive environment. So, I mean, in five outfielder leagues, you can maybe take a flyer on him, but I, I want to do it over somebody like Pham or even Naylor. All right. Luke Voigt will return to AAA to get more rehab at-bats. Uh, he's currently 0 for 18 with 12 strikeouts on his rehab assignment, so it's not going great. Edward Olivares was placed on the IL with a strained right quad. Anthony DeSclafani threw a bullpen session Monday. He's been on the IL for two weeks with an ankle injury. Evan Longoria is expected to return later this week for the Giants. He is 18% rostered. Last year, he hit 261 with 13 home runs in, I believe it was just 81 games. Scott, Looking to add Evan Longoria in deeper leagues? 
In deeper leagues, sure. I mean, how many competent third basemen are there? And and uh, like uh, his exit velocities were amazing last year. He he was top ten in average exit velocity, and and we wondered why he wasn't more productive. Considering that uh, it's been so long since he's been he's Longoria has been a, a real fantasy asset that I'd still bet against it, and being like a difference maker. But he could be a serviceable starter at third base in a deeper league. All right. Would you rather have Longoria or Brandon Drury as a corner infielder? I would I would see where Drury takes me first. All right. Casey Mines will make his first rehab start at AAA on Thursday. He's on the IL with a right elbow sprain. Tigers pitching prospect Alex Fajardo is being called up once again to start one of the doubleheader games on Tuesday for the Tigers. He was okay in his debut last week. A gentleman named Adrian Martinez will make his MLB debut and start Tuesday for the A's. He came over in the Sean Benaya trade, uh, but his ERA is very high at AAA. So don't do anything yet, but let's watch and see what he does. Mike Moustak is placed on the COVID IL Monday, joining a long list of Reds players who are currently on the shelf. And the best for last, Frankie Two Hits is back with <laughs> after getting demoted on Sunday. They, they just couldn't go through with it, Scott. They said, well, and I, I think I said on the podcast, we may never see him again. We see him the very next day. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, I don't know. I don't know that he's he's gonna be that regular part of the lineup at this point. And obviously, he's not off to a good start anyway. So I, I don't think you need to rush out and add him again. But, but yeah, he went zero for three with three strikeouts. Okay. Not great. <laughs> not great, Bob. Let's talk about some waiver wire pitchers from Monday. We had a solid pitch, solid pitchers duel out in Detroit where. Paul Blackburn was the better of the two. He went six and two-thirds shutout with three strikeouts to zero walks. Uh, how is he doing it? Great control, and he's getting a lot of ground balls. So just three walks over his first, I believe he's made five starts, and he's got a 52% ground ball rate. And I just realized his roster rate is 79%. So probably not out there for you. On the other side, Michael Pineda, fortune favors the brave. He was solid. Six and two-thirds, six hits, two runs. He had four strikeouts, a 3.43 ERA through four starts. He is 40% rostered. It's got anything on Paul Blackburn and Michael Pineda. Yeah, I still don't really get the Blackburn thing. And I there were there were some high swinging strike rates and pretty good strikeout totals early on, and, and that's kind of faded over time. I'm pretty skeptical he can sustain anything close to this, and I would Definitely consider him a sell high guy to whatever for whatever you could possibly get for him. But I understand why he's as rostered as he is, too. I mean, and until he I'm just saying don't get too attached to Paul Black to Black to Paul Blackburn. Fair enough. In deeper leagues, we've got uh Tyler Wells, who has now made three strong starts in a row and turned in his first quality start of the season on Monday. Six innings, one run, three strikeouts. Uh, pitch mix is kind of interesting. He throws four different pitches, 15-plus percent of the time. He's 8% rostered. And Jose Quintana, now three straight strong starts as well, up against the Dodgers on Monday. Six shutout innings with five strikeouts, did have four walks. Uh, the ERA is down to 2.70. Scott, anything on Tyler Wells and Jose Quintana in deeper leagues? Yeah, I mean, I'm not that excited about either. I've kind of been keeping an eye on Wells because I feel like he's looked pretty solid more often than not, but the underlying numbers aren't great. I mean, he's a less than 10% swinging strike rate himself. So, and obviously we've seen the way things have gone for Jose Quintana the past couple of years. It's been a while since he's been fantasy relevant. These are they're, they're pretty low end. They're not they're not players I'd be looking to pick up at this point. But I don't know. I guess I'll just leave it at that. All right. What should we make of these pitchers right now, Scott? Uh, mixed bag for Julio Arias on Monday. He was at the Pirates. He went six plus innings. He allowed eleven hits, two runs, four strikeouts. Uh, Michael po Kopek turned in his first quality start of the season. But I, I noticed the swinging strike rate is down so far this year. Underlying numbers are, are kind of weird. It's 
it's kind of been a mixed bag for Michael Kopech as well. Noah Syndergaard, uh, season high seven strikeouts, but uh, he's got a 2.45 ERA. Underlying numbers don't really like Syndergaard as much. He's doing some different things this year too. It seems like he's pitching to contact. And then Mackenzie Gore, he didn't have his best start. He was going up against the Cubs, five innings, three runs, six strikeouts. I love that he didn't have zero walks. So even though he didn't have everything working, the control was very good for Mackenzie Gore. Gore, Syndergaard, Kopech, mm -hmm. Arias. Scott, what do we make of this group of four? Yeah, I've got some observations about this group. So you mentioned Gore didn't walk anybody. I thought that was especially encouraging because he didn't throw his fastball as much. He's been relying on his fastball like 70% of the time. It's kept him from missing as many bats as maybe he could. But I, I wondered if that's how he was keeping hitter. Like if, that, if that's how he was limiting walks, it's just leaning on that fastball. He threw his fastball still a lot, 60% of the time though. And of his 12 swinging strikes, a combined seven came on the changeup in the curveball. And as you said, he still walked nobody. So if he's mixing in that secondary arsenal more, I think that's good for Gore. It, it may be will help him get closer to meeting his upside. And I, more than anything, I'm still hoping he just keeps his rotation spot because they're getting pretty crowded here. When Blake Snell comes back, they're already crowded for that matter. Cindergard actually did have a good bat missing performance this time. Seven strikeouts and five and a third innings, 15 swinging strikes. His velocity, I don't think it's coming back. But he's pitching like a guy who knows he doesn't have the same velocity anymore. Like just emphasizing his secondary pitches. And they may be good enough. I, I think the the more talented pitchers can sometimes get away with drops in velocity because they they have such good control and, and they have good enough secondary pitches. Like his changeup was great in this start, Cinder Guards. So I still think he's a sell high. I'm still skeptical that he's he's going to remain a high end pitcher with this kind of velocity, but I'm at least open to that idea. Uh, Arias, I want to worry about him giving up 11 hits to the Pirates. The average exit velocity against him was below 80 miles per hour, so it was it was weak contact by and large. And nine of the 11 hits were singles. I, I think it was just one of those days. And Kopech, yeah, I mean, I agree with you that he's not as dominant. He hasn't been as dominant as 093 ERA, which have you believe, as, as his stature would have you believe. But at the same time, what are you going to do about it? I mean, he's he's pitching well enough that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of inclined to just stick with him. All right, let's move over to some pitching leftovers from Monday's action. Yeah, we're almost 50 minutes in, and we're just talking about Carlos Rodon right now. And just ho-hum, another double-digit strikeout effort, six innings, two runs, 12 strikeouts, 23 swinging strikes on 110 pitches. They are letting Rodon go right now, and it's not affecting his performance. It's not affecting his velocity. Just stay healthy. Luis Castillo made his season debut. He allowed three runs over four and two-thirds against the Brewers. Ranger Suarez had his best start of the season. Six shutout with seven strikeouts. He had 15 swinging strikes in this one. And I'm just getting to Kyle Hendricks now because there was either four or five West Coast games. So uh, this game just wrapped up not too long ago. Eight and two-thirds shutout innings. One out away from a complete game for Kyle Hendricks. Allows us three hits, one walk, seven strikeouts. He had 14 swinging strikes on 116 pitches in this start. Scott, what would you like to add on Hendricks, Ranger Suarez, Luis Castillo, and Carlos Rodon? Oh, gosh, man. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot I could say about these pitches, too. So, I mean, I'm sure you mentioned Luis Castillo's velocity was way down. I didn't mention it yet. Back. Down two and a half miles per hour, basically across the board. So that's scary. And... I'm worried this that we're going to be be having an, an update for Luis Castillo. We're going to have to update everybody after every start because that's obviously he had his issues last year too. And, and beginning this season with 
a major velocity issue going on. I mean, that's not going to relieve anybody's concerns, and I'd be hesitant. I, obviously, he was coming back with the two starts this week, and he felt like he had to start him, but if that velocity doesn't improve in his next turn. I might plant him on the bench for the time being. Let's see. So Ranger Suarez, yeah, he finally had a good one. And I told you guys not to give up on him, so hopefully you didn't, because I think he's good. I think he's good. And let's see, who else? Kyle Hendricks, man. I know that I had a league where I sat him, even with two starts on the schedule. Same. So it's just frustrating how how two-faced he could be. And if not for last year, where he, he obviously his final numbers weren't that great, then you just stick with him because, okay, look at the track record. The the in the end the 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 good starts are going to outweigh the bad and you're going to be happy with the final stat line. That's what the track record says. And you know that was my case for Hendricks coming into the season to draft him with him going so late. Um, I don't know. I mean, I I still think obviously after a start like this, it's easy to say, okay, Kyle Hendricks is still good because there's nothing about this start that you can nitpick. But the, I I'm not confident he's. He's not going to go out and give up six earned runs next time. It's just, you know, if you have a lot of pitching, you probably play it safe with him more often than not. But if you don't, then I don't think you should be on the verge of dropping him or anything like that. Yeah, it was a very encouraging start for Kyle Hendricks, especially the one walk he had struggled with control so far this year. His fastball looked a lot better. Fastball <laughs> quotation marks for, uh, for Kyle Hendricks in this one, he had a 42% CSW on his four seam fastball. League average is like 28%. So getting more called strikes on that fastball just it does wonders for him because he he was not locating that pitch early in the season. 10 whiffs on his changeup. You love to see that. And then nine ground ball outs. Uh so far this year for Hendricks, the fly ball rate has been up. That was an issue for him last year as well. So this is the recipe. It's good control. It's the fastballs working, changeup is on, and getting ground balls. And when all of those things come together, this is the kind of start that we can get from Kyle Hendricks. But I still think there's going to be some inconsistency because it's just such a fine needle to thread. Is that mm -hmm. okay? Make sure I got that right. Uh, yeah. yeah, for for Kyle Hendricks, needle to thread. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Did you thread the needle because it's the hole in the needle is very small. And so it's difficult to pass the thread through it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What Scott said, uh, hitting leftovers from Monday, Bobby Witt jr. Leading off. He went one for five with his fifth steal. Quality of contact is still not great for Bobby Witt, but he has been playing better. Marcus Semyon, zero for four with two more strikeouts. He's batting one seventy eight. Uh, Scott, I mean, I'm getting question after question right now. What do I do with Marcus Semyon? Uh, I, I guess bench him for now. I, I'm not dropping Marcus Simeon. I would be trying to buy him on the very, very cheap end if I can, but it's probably not going to yeah. happen. Look, I think we all had our doubts about him coming into the year. We we all considered him a bust candidate on some level. So, you know, the, my confirmation bias wants to kick in and say, yeah, he's done. But, you know... Obviously, there was that awful 2020 season in between his two MVP caliber seasons. And even last year, he was pretty bad at the start. Not this bad, but bad enough that you wondered if he was going to be worth keeping on your team. And obviously, he proved he was over the rest of the season. So, yeah, I have no problem with sitting him until he heats up for a Brandon Drury or whatever. But I, I do think it's too early to drop him. I would give him, you know, maybe another six weeks before I really yeah. considered that. Do you feel the same way about Justin Turner? He went 0 for 3 with a walk. He's batting 168. Well, the investment in Turner isn't nearly as much. Right. But if anything, the track record is more reliable. And he plays third base. So what else are you going to do? I think, you, I think you give him a longer... Like I said just you know a few minutes ago, I'm, I'm having a really hard time sizing up any hitter right now. Uh, so I... I think anybody that you have real investment in and who exactly that includes, it, it depends on the size of your league, the format, all of that. But I, I think anybody you have real investment in, you, you got to give them probably till the end of May. 
All right. Okay. Brian Hayes went three for five with his third stolen base. He's now betting 333, only slugging 419. He does not have a home run on the season. His fly ball rate is just 26.5%. This is Brian Hayes. So that's going to make it tough for him to hit for power, but batting average, 10 to 15 steals. It's valuable. It helps somewhere, I guess. So uh, that is Brian Hayes. Jared Walsh, he's hot. He hit his sixth home run of the season. And the Phillies, they put up nine runs on 17 hits. So you check the box score. You got Kyle Schwarber on your team. You're thinking, man, he had to do something massive tonight. 0 for 5 with a strikeout. He's batting 200. He's been a little bit better recently, but Scott, that is just one of the worst feelings <laughs> when you have a player on a team that goes off. You check the box score. You have all these yeah. high expectations. Nothing. Well, yeah, I know. Remember last week, not not this current week, but last week, Hunter Renfro, I think he was my num number two on my sleeper hitters list. And the Brewers offense just went off last week. And like Hunter Renfro did nothing. He was the one guy who uh, didn't contribute to it. That's right. So, uh, yeah. As for these Phillies, though, each of Alec Bohm, Bryce Harper, Nick Castellanos, JT Real Muto, Gene Segura, Reese Hoskins, and even Odubel Herrera had multiple hits in this game. Each of those guys, uh, Segura and Hoskins, each hit a home run. Uh, Segura turning it around all of a sudden. He's batting 293. OPS is climbing near 800. So we'll take that because second base has uh, also been a wasteland this season. The call to the bullpen for the Yankees. Aroldis Chapman allowed a hit but picked up his seventh save. He has just three walks over his last seven appearances. So you'll love to see that for him. Uh, yet, Fastball velo still inconsistent, and the swinging strike rate is down for Chapman. Regardless, he's been good, so give credit where it's due. For Oakland, Danny Jimenez walked two but picked up his fifth save. He's 37% rostered. Scott, would you drop Lou Trevino for Danny Jimenez? Yeah, I think so. Trevino had worked. He had gotten the previous day off, but he had worked two of the previous three games, so maybe they just wanted to give him another day off, but like it's not like Lou Trevino some shutdown closer. I mean, he, he lost his job at some point last year, and was basically the guy at the start of this year by default. So I'm not sure why they want to just stick with Jimenez, who's done a fine job in the role. All right, uh, Liam Hendricks gave up that grand slam in the eighth inning to Josh Naylor, which I mentioned, which tied the game at the time. Emmanuel Class A on the other side, they had the lead in, I believe it was the bottom of the tenth. He gave up. A walk, a hit, he allowed the Ghost Runner to score, so that tied the game there. And then Mark Melanson pitched a clean ninth inning for his sixth save of the season. To stream or not to stream, we'll start with Tuesday. Reed Detmers versus the Rays. Yusei Kikuchi at the Yankees. Mad Bum versus the Marlins. Alex Fajardo versus the Oakland A's. Kyle Bradish at the Cardinals. Brad Keller at the Rangers. And Martin Perez versus the Royals. So I don't think we liked anyone in this group yesterday. And I added a few more to this list, but they are not very inspiring. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I think I would go with Martin Perez, number one, just because he's hot and he's going against the Royals, obviously. Yeah, but I don't have a lot of trust in him. It's it's certainly not something I'm dying to do. Uh, and then I, I think I'd go Keller too, Brad Keller at Texas too, and and then. Bum Garner, who we mentioned yesterday, would be third. Mm -hmm. Brad Keller, I, I feel similarly about him as I do Martin Perez. And the Rangers are not hitting right now, too. So I'm okay with it if you want to take a shot. For Wednesday, Jameson Tyone versus the Blue Jays. Adrian Hauser at the Reds. Chad Cool at the Giants. Nick Martinez versus the Cubs. And Chris Archer versus the Astros. I'm okay with Hauser at the Reds. I'm okay with Nick Martinez against the Cubs. Uh, as as good as Cool's been lately, I I don't want to risk it at San Francisco. I had more confidence in Gomber actually, and he we didn't mention him earlier, but he had a after three straight quality starts, he got knocked around a bit by the Giants in this one. Yes, and he was a two start sleeper for me, so that's disappointing. <sighs> he gave up five runs over five and a third for. The old Austin Gomber. Let's wrap up with Team Name Tuesday. Thank you to everybody for sending some over via Apple Podcast rating and reviews. Uh, if you want to add some there, then we will read them on next week's podcast. First up, Scott, we've got Real Gold Fam. Okay. Well, Wally Pips War. 
Oh, I'm not sure I get that one. <laughs> uh, the next one is Vladdy Schwarbucks. Okay, that's like Daddy Warbucks. That's pretty good. And Vlad and you get because Bucks like B U X like Buxton, so that you get three names in there. A movie I've actually seen, Scott. Annie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I watched it a lot growing up. It was like my grandmother's favorite movie. So okay. we watched a lot of Annie. I, I don't yeah, know why. We love uh, this man again. Yeah, that's right. Arenado hits the ball to your fences. Okay. They wrote Eagles Desperado in the in parentheses. So probably a song by the Eagles. I guess. Yeah. Flexing yeah, I on you. All right. I heard that one a few times. Tatis all folks. Like, like that's all, folks. That's a stretch. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, Marsh the Darsh. <laughs> okay. I don't know. It's probably something Randy Marsh related from South Park. Uh, this is good. Ask your doctor if Savali is right for you. You know, I, I've, I've meant to bring it. So this is Savali. He did that with Savali. I, I, I wasn't exactly sure how to how to word the joke, but every time you say Lou Trevino, it sounds like some sort of prescription medication that you see an ad like this for. <laughs> I've noticed that with his name. Every time you say Lou Trevino. Lou Trevino. Like, like it's just one straight word, Lou Trevino. Lou Trevino. Yeah. Yeah, I have a few of those. Some people call me out for the way I say innings. Sometimes I say innings with an E. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know that it's specifically you, just I... I've never thought about it before, except hearing you say it so often. Lutravino. Ask Lutravino. your doctor about Lutravino. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. When you say it like that, it does sound pretty good. Uh, this next one of Bryson Men. Okay. Solid. Finding Nemo. Yep. Visions of Johanna Santana. <laughs> Johanna Santana? Johanna Santana? I think it's a Bob Dylan song when I was researching it. Okay. I don't know. Not really into the Bob Dylan thing. From Twitter, Yepes Dispenser. Simple. I like it. Yeah, we need we need some Juan Yepes team names in here. Some emails. This one's from Robert. Uh, Freed Willy from Seawald. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't usually like the, the cramming in of that many names, but that's, that's kind of funny. That's good. I like that. From Joe, getting Miggy with it. Getting Miggy wit it. Okay. Bobby Witt. Solid. Yep. From Patrick Neris Bueller's O'Day off. Ah, well, if you're a stickler for getting, you, you can only name your team after players who are actually on your roster, then be hard to get Neris and O'Day, especially O'Day on your roster to make this yeah, work. But that's a rough one. <laughs> From Paul Hicks May on the Bombre. Okay. And this is uh, after the album from the Offspring, Ixnay on the Hombre. I know you're a big fan, Scott. Uh, did, did they have, like, were they, did they have, like, a, a whole catalog of, of hits or something, The Offspring? I, I just remember oh, yeah. the one song. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they've, right. they've got a bunch of great ones out there. Okay. Uh, and this last one's from Cajun Pete, The Flying Rutchman. I don't know why he calls himself Cajun Pete. <laughs> I, I like that more than his team name, I think. <laughs> Flying Rutschman, hopefully coming soon to a uh, Baltimore stadium near you. And we're going to wrap there. For Scott, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>